Okay, hi everyone. So today we'll continue with our second outcome for this class on uh, understanding information management systems. In particular, we will discuss uh, database design. So we'll basically discuss about modeling databases with uh, entity relationship diagrams and UML class diagrams. So we'll talk, we talked up to now how to basically implement a database in MySQL, in MongoDB, um, but really we didn't discuss about database design. And there are basically two steps in the specification of a database schema. Uh, and we have to basically design this design process. It follows in most cases, a well-defined methodology and then evaluation of the design using normalization theory. So we'll basically talk about design methodologies today uh, for relational databases. And uh, basically we'll talk about the original design methodology called the entity relationship diagram. And then uh, about a different uh, or basically another graphical notation used uh, today for uh, database design called UML class diagrams. So database design is typically a two-stage process. Uh, the initial phase is based on ER diagrams or UML diagrams. Basically we'll design a database. What are the entities? Uh, what attributes do those entities have? What are the roles of the relationships between those entities? And then we'll convert this ER diagram to SQL uh, data uh, definition language. And this is usually followed by a refinement stage using the relational normalization theory, which we'll talk about next class. Basically is we'll discuss about the cost of storing data, the elimination of the application, and then uh, the different normal forms. How do we achieve a database design that has the least amount of uh, duplication and the best basically uh, non-redundant design. Okay, And usually these steps are actually in a bit of a different order. So usually we develop the database, uh, then we refine it using normalization theory, and then we basically convert what we got up to uh, now into uh, the SQL DDL language. And before we continue with uh, uh, the ER diagrams, let's see if there are any questions. Uh, the notes are on the website, please refresh. Uh, and I will basically update them also after the class with additional notes that we are making during the class. So an entity relationship diagram uh, is a graphical representation for the entities in the database, the relationships with these, between these entities and constraints that make up the given database design. And usually this is done after the requirement analysis phase in software engineering in a software development life cycle. So we collected a description of the project from the customer and usually what we do, we try to find those uh, nouns that uh, define classes or entities. Like for instance, if the statement says a student enrolls into a class, a student and class are the nouns and we declare them as being the entities that are, will be in the database. So nouns are entities, uh, verbs, like for instance, a student enrolls into a class, the enroll verb is deemed to be a relationship between those entities. And then if we have adverbs or adjectives, for instance, a student or adjective phrase uh, or prepositional phrases, like for instance, a commerce by entity has uh, the following, uh, it's with, uh, for a sum of $200 uh, uh, from the seller uh, for a recipient and so on. Uh, 
So we basically collect the attributes from the prepositional phrases. And that's how we develop an ER diagram. We take the requirement analysis document and we basically identify the nouns as being or the subjects uh, and objects as being the entities in the ER diagram. The verbs are relationships between these entities. Uh, these relationships can also have their own attributes. And the entities that play a role in a relationship are the roles in these entities. So we'll use basically these ER diagrams as a graphical representation of the view of the database. And then we convert this into SQL and we uh, create the tables in the database. So in the ER diagrams, basically the enterprise or the process, the database is viewed as a set of entities. And these entities are basically the nouns in the requirement analysis document, like for instance, a product, an employee, a song, a student, a professor, a department, a course. Uh, relationships between these entities capture how these entities are related to each other. And in the, from the requirement analysis document, uh, they basically are seen as the verbs in these uh, requirements. They basically link these entities. Like uh, an owns relationship is between a company and the product. Certain, a certain company owns a product. A supervisor's relationship is between an employee and a department. A super, uh, an employee, like a manager, supervises uh, all the employees in a department or all of the products produced in a department and so on. A performance relationship is between an artist entity and a song. So some artist performs a song. So entities are basically those objects that are involved in the enterprise. Like for instance, if we have a core, uh, uh, a solar like uh, university database, an object could be John Smith, that is a student. A course uh, would be CSC 305 or CSC 316 or CSC uh, 416, which are basically courses. And these entities are usually grouped into types. And an entity type is the set of similar objects like students, uh, courses, departments, professors, and so on. Now, these entity types have attributes, and these attributes describe one aspect of an entity type, like, for instance, the name of uh, students, the ID of students, the class title for a class. Uh, each attribute of a specific entity specifies a particular property for that entity. So the name of uh, the student John Smith is John Smith. Uh, for instance, another example is that, that an employee might have a social security number. That's an attribute for that entity type. And each entity might have, must have uh, the associated attribute. An entity type is described by the set of, their, uh, of its attributes and by the domain of every one of those attributes. For instance, the entity type person has the attributes ID, name, address, hobbies. And you, for each one of them, you have to specify the type, the domain of uh, that attribute. So ID is uh, an integer, name is a string, address is a string, hobbies are strings, and so on. Now, there is one difference between the, relations, the relational uh, databases model and ER diagrams. And that difference is in the fact that an attribute value can be a set. Like for instance, this uh, entity that we have below for John uh, that lives at 123 Main Street and has the ID uh, six ones uh, has multiple hobbies, stamps, coins, and so on. So in ER diagrams, you can have set valued uh, attributes or set valued uh, columns. Now, also in ER diagrams, we have keys, which is a minimum set of attributes that uniquely identifies an entity. And again, we call them candidate keys, like we call them in, in the 
uh, relational model, a relational database model, uh, and you may have multiple keys, but usually in the ER diagram, we, uh, we have a key, one key that we underline, and that basically it's a primary key for our entity. And these are attributes that are underlined in the ER diagram. Usually in ER diagrams, we have one key per, uh, per entity type. The entity schema is the entity type, the attributes and their associated domain and the key constraints, basically a set of uh, uh, attributes that basically are a candidate key. Now, ER diagrams are usually visualized and also so UML class diagrams are visual, uh, visual representation, a graphical representation of the model of the database. Basically entity types are represented as rectangles and their attributes are ovals around connected to the entity types. And later we'll see that relationships are diamonds or basically diamond notation and they can also have attributes. So this is an example of a, a ER a diagram entity. The entity person has the attributes, name, address, social security number, hobbies, and some attributes like hobbies, which are circled with two ovals is a set valued attribute. So this is an entity type person. It has four different attributes. Hobbies is a set valued attribute and the attributes that participate in the primary key are underlined. Like for instance, the SSN is a primary key for the entity person. So every single person entity uh, must have a unique social security number. Relationships are related to two or more entities. So for instance, as I said earlier, from the requirement analysis document, we collect them uh, by looking at the verbs, like majors. John majors in computer science. Majors will be a relationship type. Basically, it's a set of similar relationships between the same two entity types. And in this example, majors in is a relationship type that relates the role of student as an entity type and department as an entity type. So basically a relationship has multiple roles and those roles are entities that play in that relationship. Now, there is a distinction between DB uh, database, the database relational model and ER uh, database design model uh, or the entity relationship uh, model. And that is that in a relation a relation in the relational uh, database model are just sets of tuples. They are these tables that basically contain uh, the tuples, the rows that are in that relation. A relationship in the ER diagram is basically this graphical notation that defines entities and relationships and the connections between these entities and relationships and uh, uh, between entities. So they both start with relation, but really a uh, relationship is a term that we are using in ER diagrams. Relation is a term that we use in a relational model. And in fact, when we translate an ER database design model into a relational uh, database, we are going to use relations to implement both entities and relationships from the ER model. So both entity types and relationship types are modeled as relations in the relational model. Now, a relationship has roles and attributes. Roles are basically the names that we give for the related entities. Like for instance, uh, the role student in the relationship uh, majors in, is basically uh, uh, in the student entity. Uh, the name of the role and the name of the entity do not have to be the same, but in most cases they are the same. Uh, the only cases when they could be different are basically the cases when uh, 
uh, the, the relationship uh, defines relations between uh, entities in the same entity type, okay? So in this example, basically the majors in a relationship has two roles, the role of student, which is played by John and the role of department, which is play, uh, played by CS. And the relationship is basically the fact that John uh, is in CS since 2016, which actually introduces us to the sec second part of uh, relationships, which are attributes. So relationships like entities may also have attributes themselves. An attribute is basically an additional field uh, that describes that relationship. Like for instance, we know that uh, the majors uh, in relationship connects John with CS, but we also want to add an additional attribute that since 2016, John is a CS major. So John and CS are related uh, and 2016 is a property, an attribute of the uh, majors in relationship type. And we can represent everything in basically one standard way that a relationship type has roles and attributes. Like for instance, in majors in student and department are roles. And then since is an attribute. And they basically, they are tuples that specify what entity is connected with what entity under what attributes, okay? And the roles basically are uh, the name of uh, uh, entities that play a role in the current relationship. The only problem when we have different names for the, enti for the roles than the actual uh, entity is when you have a relationship between entities in the same entity type. So for instance, reports two is a relationship between uh, employees and other employees, like Bob reports to Mary. So we'll basically have a relationship between two different entities in the same entity type. And we, what we usually do, we allow to have distinct names for the roles, uh, but for the same entity type. So this is basically the solution that reports will have two different roles, subordinate and supervisor, but they are both under the same entity. So this relationship has two different roles in the same entity type. And now I can show you the graphical representation. So remember that entities are represented as, uh, as uh, uh, rectangles. Now we can basically represent relationships as diamonds that connect multiple of these entities. So for instance, works in is a relationship between professor and department. So a professor works into a department. Also, we have attributes for these relationships. Like for instance, since is an attribute of the works in uh, relationship. So you can basically see here that if, you, if I would have to translate this into a relational database, each one of these entities and uh, relationships are translated into uh, tables or relations. A professor table, a works in table that has a foreign key to professor and a foreign key to department and an additional uh, attribute since and the department uh, uh, relation, which basically has all of the fields of department. So it's a standard one-to-one -one correspondence in this case from uh, entities, relations into re uh, relationships into relations in the relational model. Another example below, we have the fact that uh, a student majors into a program. And again, it has a property, an attribute since associated to that relationship. Now an example where there is a relationship between two, et two entities in the same entity type. So reports two has two roles, subordinate and supervisor, and they are both instances of employee. So if I would have to translate reports two to uh, the relational model, I would have a table 
that has two foreign keys to the same employee table. So it's basically an example where you have in one tuple two different foreign keys to another table. And they are different because the su supervisor and the subordinate are different people. And similarly to that example, we have married to a relationship between uh, two people and we name them husband and wife. Uh, it has an additional attribute uh, date. Uh, then I have a ternary relationship sold, which connects a customer, a product and a supplier. And additionally, we may have uh, uh, basically a, a date and a, a, a price attribute. Now, in some cases, we cannot represent the key because the key is basically a, a combination of the multiple attributes and roles that are in that relationship. So in that case, we'll basically represent it with a string, either within the diamond or next to the diamond because usually it doesn't fit into that diamond. So there is a key in the relationship sold and that key is that a customer can only buy a product once uh, per day. So basically you can't buy, a customer cannot buy multiple products uh, in one single day or the same product twice uh, in a day. Okay. Most attributes I omitted because I didn't want to make this too complex. A professor may have multiple attributes, similar departments may have at multiple attributes and so on. So this is quite common that you represent entities as separate constellations, basically the professor rectangle and it's many ovals that have the attributes. And this is actually quite common in UML too, when we will discuss about UML next, that you basically can rep you represent the class diagram with all the fields separately. And then when you write the relations between the different uh, uh, tables or uh, classes they are called in UML diagrams, uh, you basically just write the name of that relation, the name of that table. The schema of a relational uh, relationship type includes the list of uh, attributes along with their corresponding domains, like for instance, integer uh, ID or date, uh, by, by date, okay? An attribute can be also single valued, which is a single oval or set valued, which are two ovals uh, around basically that attribute. A list of roles along with uh, their corresponding entity types are also part of the relationship type. So basically these are the roles and their entity types. And unlike attributes, roles are always single valued. You have one, entity playing a role into the current relationship. And then there are also a set of constraints. So let's talk about constraints. Constraints are basically uh, how many relationships exist for a, certain at, uh, for a certain entity. We'll discuss about it next after we write a formal representation for a relationship in ER diagrams. So a relationship contains the role names. We label them with capital R and then the index that we are going to use like RI uh, and the corresponding entity sets like R1 is student, R2 is professor, R3 is let's say uh, course. Roles are single valued as I mentioned uh, before. The number of roles uh, is what is called the degree of the relationship. The attribute names uh, like A1 to AN, uh, AJ, they basically are the corresponding uh, attributes and their domains, like name is a string, uh, ID is an integer. And then what's the minimum set of roles and attributes that uniquely identify a relationship? And that's the key of that relationship. As I said, in ER diagram, we usually have a key per every single relationship or uh, entity. So one single key. We, can, we call it candidate key, but it's one usually. A relationship is basically now a tuple with all of the entities that play the, the corresponding roles 
and the attributes of that relationship. So EIs are entities in the entity type corresponding to that role RI and uh, AJ is basically the attributes corresponding to that relationship. Again, these attributes have values in the corresponding domain AJ, uppercase AJ. The constraints are of multiple kinds and there are also multiple notations. For instance, the first type of constraint is single role key constraints. Uh, the meaning of this constraint, uh, it's all of these are called uh, participation constraints, are that at most uh, that one entity participates in at most one relationship. Uh, basically, a professor can be in at most one department, like the home department is at most one. And why at most one? Because some professors are in institutes uh, and they are not their home is not assigned to be a department. So uh, 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 the, the representation in the graphical uh, representation of ER diagrams is an arrow, a thin arrow from the entity professor to the relationship works in, states that in the works in, like for instance, when we have a, a table corresponding to works in, there is at most one tuple that has a professor that has a, the professor's ID, okay? So these are single role key constraints, okay? So for instance, if you have, let's say as another example, uh, a major uh, majors in main department, a student can have majors in, in a, at most one department. Before he declares a major, he has basically no major yet assigned and then you can specify that he has a single, uh, at most one major. This is one example of a single uh, role key constraint. Now, there are many different notation styles used in ER diagrams. The Chen style is the one that we are using here, like single arrow. Uh, we are going to use thicker arrow, which means exactly one and so on. These are the original Chen style if you're looking at ER diagrams, even today, you will see that most common notations are this Chen style notation for ER diagrams. For other types of diagrams, like for instance, for UML diagrams, we have uh, Bachmann style, Martin style, Crowfoot, you, will, you see it in, a do in many tools uh, with basically multiple lines that look like a Crowfoot. It basically, it's a many constraint. Uh, in this class, we are going to use the original Chen style for ER diagrams. So all of these arrows that you will see are the ones used in uh, uh, ER diagrams in the original Chen style. Participation constraints. Uh, another participation constraint is at least one. And uh, like for instance, every professor works in at least one department. There are professors that work in multiple departments. Let's say Professor Joe Mitchell works in applied math and also works in computer science and maybe other departments. So the representation in ER diagrams is a thicker line, means that every professor must have at least one tuple in the works in a relationship. And then exactly one is the combination of the previous two. Uh, the, uh, the at most one was an arrow, at least one was a thicker line. So in exactly one means a thicker arrow. And it basically mean that, means that in the works in a relationship, every single professor is represented by exactly one tuple. So every one professor works in exactly one department. So thicker arrow means exactly one relationship. Every single entity on, in this case, in the professor left-hand side entity has exactly one tuple that reference it, uh, reference it uh, in the works in relationship. The question on the chat is, is the right-hand side always a regular line? No. So, Basically, this the, the left hand side here only specifies that professor has exactly one tuple. 
uh, I could have exactly the same from department that every department has exactly one uh, professor. So uh, a relationship may be between multiple entities. Each entity has its own association. Basically the entity type uh, professor states that uh, every professor must have exactly one tuple in works in. And then department doesn't have that requirement in this example. So it may be zero to N relationships uh, uh, in, in the works in relationship type. Okay. So we usually have, again, a formal notation. We have C is an entity type. A is a relationship that connects uh, uh, C to C via a role R. And these roles basically have a cardinality constraint. And it can be also written in the form of minimum maximum, which basically states that for uh, if we look at the role R, the number of relationships uh, instances of uh, the type A in a single entity of the type C can be between minimum mean and maximum max. Okay. So it basically the same notation that we have seen before uh, with arrow, it can be written as uh, zero to one or thick arrow, it's really just one. But basically we have this minimum maximum cardinality constraint, meaning that the number of tuples in the relation that represents the relationship A is for every instance of C must be between one and two. So at least one and at most two. So basically means that we cannot have multiple relationships like let's say A3 that in which one relation, one entity C appears three times. Okay, because the maximum is two and the minimum is one. So either we have one or we have two relationships in that relationship type that uses that entity uh, uh, C. For every entity C in the entity type uppercase C. So there are basically multiple ways to represent these uh, constraints. We can use arrows and tick lines as we had before, or we just label every role with uh, its cardinality constraint. So for instance, uh, every entity of the type C must appear uh, either less than one time in the uh, tuples of the relationship A. So basically it either doesn't appear at all or it appears at most once. Okay. And now we can basically have all of these notations. And usually we have uh, zero to one, meaning zero or one, one for exactly one. Uh, we don't need to write it as one dot dot one because really is one means minimum one, maximum one. Uh, zero to star, star represents many or infinity. It means zero or more. One to star meaning one to more. Uh, N is exactly N. Like for instance, let's say every marriage has exactly two people uh, enrolled uh, uh, in that role. Uh, zero to N, uh, it's really any number. One to N means, or uh, zero to N means less than N where N is greater than uh, one and one to n means uh, at least one, but at most n. So now basically those uh, key constraints that we have seen before, like for instance, just a line means zero to star, any number. Uh, the simple uh, fin arrow means zero to one, at most one. Uh, the tick line means one to star, at least one, and tick arrow means exactly one uh, between the entity. So the entity plays that role in the relationship of this cardinality constraint. So now you can actually see in this example that we have a bunch of tuples in the relationship B, but these constraints basically tell us from those tuples, 
given an instance of uh, an entity in one of these entity types, how many tuples we can find minimum and maximum in the relationship B. So basically for an instance of uh, the entity C, we can find zero or one uh, instance uh, tuples in B that uh, are basically a foreign key to that uh, entity C. So basically, the cardinality, the, the participation constraint for every, L, for every instance of the entity C is at most one. And similarly for D. Now for E and F, it basically means that any instance of the entity E can appear any number of times in the relationship B and so for F. So for instance, now we can actually do this multiple uh, entity relationships. So uh, if, if you do have a relationship in B that involves uh, C and D, then there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between C and D. So for instance, uh, every person has one spouse and the same place in the opposite order because the spouse has exactly one spouse, okay? And then there are uh, many to many relationships or one to many relationships. So for instance, a one to many relationship is uh, father of children. So there may be multiple children, that is, or there is only one father. And similarly, uh, there can be siblings relationships. So uh, there are multiple children and they are basically siblings of also multiple children. So there are one-to-one -one relationships based on these cardinality constraints. There are one-to-many relationships like parent or father to children or mother to children. And then there are many-to-many -many relationships. Now, in ER diagrams, we also have inheritance hierarchies, which if you took CSC 114, you learned about UML diagrams and the fact that you can represent inheritance. Some class is a subtype of another class. We have the same between entities in ER diagrams. So uh, in order not to have duplication of attributes, you can basically define that a class or an entity is a subtype of another entity. So all the attributes of, for instance, the super type uh, student entity uh, are also inherited by the freshman. A freshman has all the same attributes and maybe more. And such a relationship exists between freshman entity and student entity. Instead of using a diamond, we are going to use a triangle and we are going to point towards the uh, super type uh, entity, like in this case, the student entity. So like a freshman entity, John, is related to the student entity, John, uh, because basically has all of the properties of the, of the student, John, but in addition may have other, in what college he or she is, uh, as a freshman. This relationship is called ESA and is represented by a triangle as we basically have the same in UML diagrams. So in this example, basically you have that student is either a freshman or a sophomore or a, a junior or a senior. And in fact, we have additional constraints, contains, which basically states that every instance of student must be in one of these and distinct saying that uh, the same student cannot be in multiple of these uh, entities. So John is either a freshman or a sophomore or a junior or a senior. So the properties of ESA are the same that we have in object-oriented prog uh, programming. The attributes of the super type apply to the subtype, they are inherited. Like for instance, the GPA attribute of student applies to freshmen. Sub subtypes inherit all of the attributes of the super type. The key of the super type is also a key of the subtype. So for instance, the ID for the student is also a key 
uh, if it was a keen student, is also a key for freshmen. We also have transitivity. If you inherit, if there are uh, like grandfather relationship, father relationship, and children relationship. So student is a subtype of person, a freshman is a subtype of student, then freshman is also a subtype of student. Uh, or actually, I should have said freshman is also a subtype of person. Because we know that freshman is a subtype of student. And we uh, student inherits all of the attributes of person, freshman inherits all of the attributes of student, so therefore freshman inherits all of the attributes of person. Okay. So here we have examples. Basically, we have person, and person has attributes name and date of birth and social security number. Then student is a sub entity of person with additional attributes, GPA and start date. A freshman is a sub-entity of student, and sophomore is a sub-entity of student with an additional major attribute. And you can see that a student can be at one time either a freshman or a sophomore or a junior or a senior. It cannot be uh, two of these types. These types are basically, these entities are basically disjoint. Uh, sometimes we also have contains, meaning that uh, there are no instances of student that are not freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior. So basically, uh, the super entity contains all of the sub entities. And also one other thing to notice is the fact that we have, we also inherit the key. So that SSN that was a key for person is inherited by employees, students, uh, freshmen, sophomore, junior and senior. So the key in the super type is inherited in the subtypes. So what is the, what advantages of ESA are clear by now for you because you took uh, object-oriented programming and you know that it basically eliminates the application. Uh, you don't need to repeat the attributes that are already defined in the super type or the super entity. They can be grouped into one place. You can have all of the attributes that are uh, in the subclasses in the super class. And uh, you can have additional attributes in the siblings. Like for instance, as I said, the freshman may have a college, an undergraduate college, as opposed to a sophomore that has a major. And maybe uh, seniors have uh, multiple majors or a second major as an additional attribute. Now, we may also have, as I stated in uh, inheritance hierarchy, uh, associated constraints, a covering constraint is the fact that the union of subtype entities is equal with the set of super type entities. So basically, if you have subtypes of employee, like uh, secretary, technician, and other subtypes, the union of those subtypes is equal with uh, the entities in the entity type employee. The disjoint constraint is the set that is the fact that sets of subtype entities are disjoint from each other. So a student cannot be freshman and sophomore at the same time. So freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior are disjoint sets. Uh, now, I mentioned this earlier that when we want to convert an ER diagram to a relational database, usually entities correspond directly to relations. The only problem arises when we have set valued attributes, like for instance, hobbies. Because in a relational database, we usually, uh, we use the same key as the entity type, but now the key will not be a key in the relational database because basically the uh, key plus the, uh, the key may actually participate in multiple tuples. So the key plus the hobby can be a key. So there are multiple problems with this solution. The fact that you, you still have redundancy. 
We represented the multiple hobbies in separate tuples, which basically means that uh, those attributes that do not belong to the, the set attribute are now represented as separate tuples. Okay. So the key of the original entity is not a key for the relation. And we need to further transform this. And usually through normalization, what happens is that we create a separate table for the uh, for the uh, hobbies so we'll have a separate table that has the id and the hobby and in that case everything is fine because in the table corresponding to a person we have the id the name and the address and in a separate table we have the id and the hobby and the cad together they can be a key Typically, also relationships become a relation in the relational model. So we have a relation that corresponds to that relationship and the attributes of the relationship are integrated into the attributes of the relation. For each role, we have a foreign key uh, to the primary key of the entity type associated with that role. So for instance, teaching will have a foreign key to all courses and a foreign key to professor ID. Basically the IDs, the keys that are in those two tables. So for teaching, we would have section number and course code as foreign key uh, together, a complex foreign key to fall courses. So you see that if fall courses had as a key course code and section number, and professor has ID as the foreign key, then the roles in the teaching are the course code and the section number as a composed foreign key to fall courses and the ID as a foreign key to professor. Sometimes you may have additional attributes, like for instance, TAs is a, another attribute for uh, uh, in the foreign key, in the key, of teaching, sorry, in the key of teaching, okay? Now, this is not normalized. One thing that you may notice is the fact that now the course code, the section number, the ID and the room uh, are duplicated if we have multiple TAs. Like in my class, I have 10 TAs, I will have 10 tuples in teaching instead of having a single tuple for the class that I'm teaching. So that's why we need another step, which is normalization, which we'll discuss next class. Because really, if I have a set attribute in a relationship, I would like to represent it as a separate entity. And then uh, we'll basically use another relationship to model it with the relationship teaching. And it's easier to represent that in the UML di uh, class diagram that we'll discuss next. So the candidate key of the corresponding table, like for instance, we have in the, this previous example, should include TAs, because now we can actually see that the course code section number and ID of the professor do not uniquely identify uh, re, uh, relations in the relationships, okay? So basically we'll need to include the TAs as part of the key the new key of the relation that represents that relationship type. So when we represent it in SQL, like in this example, first we do this translation to tables or relations, and then we basically write uh, SQL DDL uh, create table statements in which the roles are represented as foreign keys to the corresponding uh, relations to the entity types in the original ER diagram. And this looks something like this, that basically let's say that we had the relationship sold with the attributes date and price and the roles for project supplier and part. And now uh, the table corresponding to this relationship sold has the fields uh, price, and date, which are the attributes for that relation. The professor ID, which is a foreign key to the ID, uh, project ID, sorry about that, uh, which is a foreign key to the project ID attribute. 
uh, the supplier ID, which again, it's a foreign key to the supplier ID attribute and the, the part number, which is basically uh, the part in uh, the part in the part entity. And these are basically enumerated as the foreign keys. Again, there are uh, the DBMS systems that require you to, even if the ID is, if the attribute is the same, to actually specify it uh, when you use references. Like MySQL requires this to be explicitly included, although we know that it is the same with the project ID here. But basically, I will make this change so you can use this directly in MySQL. Now, relation in the relationship model, the representation uh, for a key of the relation corresponds to the key corresponding to the relationship type. So if the ID is the primary key in professor, then professor ID uh, is the key in uh, works in if that is a single key constraint. So basically, the constraints that we have in the ER diagrams can be translated as constraints in uh, the relational model in the database. So if this was a single key constraint, then in works in, we basically have a, a, a primary key, which is the professor ID, okay? So the primary key for works in is the professor ID is uh, basically we can define other keys, but since we had this relationship, uh, this arrow that is a cardinality constraint of at most once, that means that in the tuple so works in, we have at most one tuple that corresponds to a professor. Supertypes and subtypes can also be implemented as separate relations. And we need to identify the fact that some attributes in the subtype are basically related to a unique supertype entity. So we usually choose a candidate key in the supertype, make it an attribute of all the entity types in the hierarchy, and then every single uh, entity in the hierarchy makes reference to that uh, uh, key as basically a foreign key to its parent. So when you have to translate from primary key in the super type to all of the subtypes, basically we have, let's say student, which has an ID and some attributes, then freshman, sophomore, junior and senior, they all have uh, that ID and additional attributes. So this eliminates duplication and we also have the foreign keys to the parent. So in all of these, we'll basically have a foreign key that the ID in, let's say, freshman, and in this case, I'll just move it here, references the ID in student. So it is the same attribute, but it's basically uh, in the sub table, in the table below the previous table. And this works for all of the uh, subtypes like senior, junior, uh, sophomore, and freshman. The advantage is that it eliminates redundancy. So if we have multiple proper, multiple attributes for let's say the same student, uh, like every single class that the student took as let's say a freshman, we don't have duplicates. We have duplicate of the ID in the subtype, but will not have duplicates of uh, other attributes. And here I have an example that every person has a name and the date of birth. And then if I have student, I will state the additional attributes like GPA, start date, but I don't have to, I don't have to specify the name and the date of birth because that's already inherited by the student entity type from the person entity type. Okay. So it eliminates redundancy, this translation into relational databases. Uh, now, we have other types of cardinality constraints, like for instance, uh, at least one. So if a professor is in at least one department, again, the professor ID is a foreign key uh, 
in the for works in as a foreign key to professor. So we have ID references uh, uh, works in professor ID. We can basically represent it as a key in works in, and then we basically refer refer it from professor. In the general case, we would create an assertion or a constraint. However, as I told you in a previous class, about two classes ago, <clears throat> assertions are rarely implemented in databases, although they were included in the SQL standard in 1992. So for instance, MySQL uh, and also Oracle do not have assertions. So best of using uh, our foreign keys and primary keys as uh, constraints in relational databases. There are also triggers, which we'll not discuss in this class. They are basically event condition action rules. If an event happens like an update uh, and the condition is satisfied, then you do a certain action on the database like for instance, update all the IDs in a different uh, table, okay? We also cannot use uh, foreign keys if the professor ID is not a candidate key in works in, because a professor ID can appear multiple times in works in. So we would only use candidate keys when we ha basically have uh, at least once or exactly once. Participation and single row constraints are therefore uh, implemented with foreign keys and primary keys in the resp respective tables. So for instance, one-to-one -one, uh, relationship is basically represented or one-to-many relationships in this case is represented with, uh, because from professor to works in, we have a one, exactly one uh, participation constraint that basically means that the ID is a primary key in professor. And also this ID is a foreign key to exactly one tuple in works in. And that basically says that all professors must participate uh, at uh, exactly once. Uh, an alternative solution is if both the key and the participation constraint apply. Basically we merge the tables for the relationship and the entity. So like for instance, such a case where we have professor and then works in department, we would merge when we translate in the relational database, the two tables together. And because we know that every professor has works in exactly one department. So basically we, we can merge the entity with the relationship is not commonly done since it uh, uh, introduces another layer of complexity. Now, this table, instead of representing only professors, also represents in what department their home is, okay? So it's an optional way to translate uh, ER diagrams into the relational model. Now, the truth is that ER diagrams is a very standard and formal language for representing uh, database design, but the, the, it's a little bit verbose, graphically verbose. You have all of these constellations of entities with their attributes, and then you have the relationships represented with a different notation, the diamond notation. So really the, what is used today and what I used for defining your final projects, a uh, project is the unified modeling language or UML. UML really was developed as a standard by a consortium of all the companies involved in uh, software engineering. And it unifies a number of methodologies in software engineering, business modeling, management, database design, object-oriented programming, and so on. And is gaining popularity in uh, lots of areas of design, including databases, design, programming languages, object-oriented programming. Now, one of the type of diagrams in UML, I will not address the other ones today. I will actually address them 
in a follow-up lecture after the second midterm on software engineering. Uh, so one of the types of diagrams in UML are called class diagrams. And you already know class diagrams. Basically, you use them in CSC 114, uh, our computer science one class for modeling uh, object-oriented programming inheritance. So uh, we are using classes for entities and we have also relationships represented by lines basically uh, uh, to connect multiple classes. MySQL uh, data model drawing tool is between ER and UML diagrams. So from MySQL, you can basically obtain the, uh, the UML diagram, but it's really uh, something between ER and UML. It's, UML is still the standard way to actually design classes, uh, design tables uh, in uh, relational databases. So entities are represented in UML as a rectangle, but the attributes, instead of being ovals around the entity, they are listed under the class. So we have person and the attributes name, SSN, address, and hobbies. One advantage of UML is the fact that these uh, entities or these classes also have associated methods. So we can already say that uh, for instance, methods available for person are change address, add hobby, and so on. And they are quite useful when we learn sequence diagrams, because sequence diagrams specify how are these methods implemented using other methods in other entities, other uh, instances of these classes. So for instance, in order to, let's say, enroll a person, we'll have to find if that class has enough seats uh, and then to actually enroll that person in that class, update uh, a, 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 a tuple in, the, in that relation. Now, relationships are represented as lines of different types between uh, the different entities. So again, we have uh, relationships like reports to that uh, relate the same entity, uh, the same entity types. So basically a subordinate with a supervisor. Uh, some relationships like works in uh, are between professor entities and departments. And now uh, if you have additional attributes that you want to add to the UML diagram, usually you can represent it in two different ways. You can represented with a dotted line that that relationship is represented in a separate table, uh, a separate class works in. And we have a foreign key to professor, a foreign key to department, and we have an additional attribute scenes, which is a date. So basically it states that this, this professor works in that department since 2016. You also specify primary keys and foreign keys and you can specify additional keys in uh, UML diagrams. You can also have ternary relationships, like for instance, sold is a relationship between a project, a part, and a supplier. And again, they are basically represented in uh, uh, the relational model for databases as additional uh, relations. But this notation gives us an easy way to translate from the ER diagram or UML diagram to the corresponding relation, relations in the relational model. Now, let's get back to this topic of multiplicity constraints. So in ER diagrams, we had the entities and how many the participation constraint in, into the relationship. So basically for every one of the entities that we had on the line between that entity and the relationship uh, type, we basically had the cardinality constraint, zero to one or one to N or zero to one, uh, zero, uh, one to N, uh, zero to N and so on. 
for uh, UML diagrams, actually, that uh, cardinality constraint appears at the opposite end of the association or relationship. So I can show you an example. Basically, this is a UML diagram that specifies that a class C participates in a binary association A with D. But really, the, uh, what, what we are saying here is the fact that an, uh, a C, an object of the type C participates in at least one such association with objects of the type D. So the cardinality is actually represented at the other end uh, as opposed to ER diagrams. So it's a little bit tricky in that respect. Okay. Uh, UML diagrams also have uh, is uh, hierarchies, which you already are familiar with. I will not spend more time on this. Basically, student is a subclass of person, freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior are subclasses of student which are complete. So the union of the subclasses is equal with the set of students and disjoint. One of those students cannot be in multiple than one of these subclasses. Parts of relationship. And now you can basically see this example of where do you put actually the cardinality constraint. So for instance, uh, aggregation, we also have composition, but let's start with aggregation. And the sub part basically tells you that a, uh, an automobile has exactly four wheels. So you can basically see now the fact that the constraint that tells us that in this relationship, we have uh, an association between one automobile and uh, wheels of exactly four. So in the relationship table between car, uh, automobile and wheel, we have four tuples corresponding to the same ID of an automobile. So you see that the constraint that appears here is really to the fact that uh, basically there are four tuples in that relationship corresponding to automobile. So basically every car has four wheels. And exactly the opposite about wheels. A wheel can be put on at most one car. So basically uh, uh, it's either not put on any car, zero, or a maximum of one, it's put at on one car, okay? Similarly, a program may have more, uh, must have more than three courses and the course can appear in any number of programs, okay? Now, this is a non-exclusive part of relationship because a course can appear in multiple programs. And more specifically, if a program is canceled, it doesn't delete the course instances because that course plays a role in multiple programs. So this is a non-exclusive relationship, basically meaning that a course may basically play, is not linked to one program in particular. It may be actually part of multiple programs. And we have the opposite of that, which is composition relationship. So when a subpart is destroyed and the relationship is destroyed, that connection to the master object is destroyed. So for instance, if on the taxis, we have a dependent, a dependent is associated with exactly one employee. One employee may have multiple dependents, but if the employee, let's say, uh, passes away, then the dependents must be associated now to other relationships. So basically they are deconnected from the relationships, okay? And the same with the university, let's say goes bust, all the programs offered by that university are also destroyed. Maybe as a better example, I should only show the second example because that's a straightforward, clear example. So, Participation constraints are a little bit different. As I explained to you, uh, it's basically we have the representation of the constraint uh, in a one way in ER diagrams and in a completely different way in UML diagrams. Also, ER diagrams are more uh, uh, expressive. 
So for in ER diagrams, you specify in that relationship exactly how many of, uh, let's say, instances of the tuples in the relationship may contain an instance of uh, the entity C. So you have a specific uh, number that is associated for how many relationships, minimum and maximum of uh, the relationship A may contain every instance of C. So it's really a straightforward way to understand how the relationship uh, carnality constraint works. For UML diagrams, we don't have such a direct uh, notation. So basically before we had that for every instance of C, there are entities D and E such that uh, C participates in at least one relationship of A that connects to D and E. If we use the different notation, now it doesn't mean that anymore, basically. And actually, it may be actually something that we may want because now we basically say that for every instance of C and every instance of E, there is at least, uh, a, at least one object in D that participates in that uh, uh, relationship type A, okay? So really, there is no one-to-one -one correspondence. It's not always possible to represent uh, in UML ER diagrams. But UML, in fact, one way to see UML is that A is now not a relationship, but actually a relation itself. And then one to star, really the meaning in this case is that an instance of D appears in at least one instance of the relationship A. So really, before we had relations, this, this distinction between relationships and entities, and the a relationship would always have to connect multiple entities, while now the relationship becomes a relation itself. And the cardinality constraint is not a multiple array relationship, but is really a cardinality constraint between the relationship and the entity. Okay. So for ternary relations, it's not always possible to translate one to one from ER diagrams to UML diagrams. But the truth is that most people just think directly in UML diagrams terms. So these are all relations and we specify the cardinality constraints between relations. And here I have a bigger example. So I was thinking of our project where we have courses, uh, enrollments between students and courses. Then we have faculty that teach these courses and these courses classes are taught in a certain classroom unless they are online and so on. And I modeled it as an ER diagram, but the truth is that you have multiple ways to implement these ER diagrams. And sometimes you can basically model uh, an attribute as an attribute, or you can model it as an entity itself and a relationship. So I have an example after I wrote it into SQL, in which case, let's assume that semester has multiple attributes, like basically it could be that a semester has uh, the year and uh, the semester, the spring uh, versus fall versus summer. So really you can represent semester as an attribute of transcript relationship, or you can represent semester as a separate entity with its attributes, with its additional attributes. So there are transformations between binary to ternary relationships. So they don't represent the same, they're not equivalent. So if you have salt relationship between three entities, when you represent it as binary relationships, you don't always have the same. You can represent in this direction, you can transform salt from a ternary relation into three relationships but that doesn't mean that if I add an instance from supplier to part in supplies, now I can't transform it back into ternary relationships. So it's really easier to just see it as an anary relationships and represent them in that world. 
that's all that I wanted to tell you about modeling databases. And in next class, we are going to get into uh, normalization theory. Basically, once we decided, like in our project, to use a specific UML diagram, uh, how do we improve it? How do we make it more efficient so that it eliminates redundancy? Okay. Also, I will cover next class a simple example that implements uh, basically your uh, uh, homework four. I actually wrote it, but I don't have enough time today to cover it all. It's basically a simple example in which what I basically do is uh, I create an express server for uh, to MySQL uh, uh, to a date to basically a web page that I implemented for selecting or finding all of the classes for a specific uh, filter, which are all fields or course name, and then the express server basically redirects that. Uh, uh, redirects requests to a MySQL database in which I basically query with SQL, uh, select all the courses that match, like basically the searching criteria. I will go over this example next class, okay? Uh, it's still in development, it's still a draft. But basically it unifies what we talked about Node and Express and then uh, using MySQL from Node, which is the basically the requirement for homework three, homework four. By the way, what I want you to do, and I want to include this into uh, our um, uh, discussion uh, next class, is basically the association between you and the grading TAs. So I will pin this to the top. Basically, the point is the following. This homework will be graded in person. And for matching you with your TA, you first have to find who's your grading TA. So let's take as an example, Aurora. Uh, Aurora. Aurora's grading TA is Sid. Open the Google Drive. Open the uh, spreadsheet for Sid, and then copy your name into the, uh, the, timings, the time slot for uh, basically that TA. So basically the grading appointments are, uh, they start and they end within a time period. Hopefully all of you will have at least five minutes within that time period to basically see the TA and you will join the office hours uh, during that time. And what I want you to do is basically find the time slot that is available, cut from this column your name and put it in the time period that you want to be tested. And you do this for basically your TA. I have something similar for the final project. So you see your colleague already did this. I have something similar for the final project, but uh, for building teams. So the final project, uh, I've decided that we should probably do it in teams because it's uh, uh, basically uh, quite short period of time. And what I would want you to do, but not right now, after we finish with homework uh, for pairing, is that you basically pair yourself with other students after you discuss with those, you communicate with those students, for the teams of the final project. We will have teams of two. Uh, and then if we have any students left over, I will add them to one of the teams of two. I want to use exactly the same grading TAs. So basically I will do the same associations and the TAs will grade the project for both students. Okay. So start with uh, the associations for uh, homework for grading appointments. Just basically cut your name from the column for pairing and put it in the one of the uh, appointment times. That's all for today. Let me stop the recording and then I can, let me take additional questions. No, no quiz today. <laughs>
meter two will be, as you see, between the two uh, meters only from databases. I will have a sample meter posted in uh, a couple of days, hopefully by, by Thursday, and then we'll discuss it next week. Is it necessary to be in a team? No. If you want to work alone for this project, you can work alone. Starting next semester is actually an outcome of this, uh, of this uh, uh, course that it's a team project, but this semester there is no requirement to be in a team. You can work alone if you want to. Okay, thank you very much. See you next class. Wait, Professor, I have a quick question Go about ahead. cardinality. Ah, uh, let's take a few more questions and then I can take your question. Okay, uh, okay. Do we have an idea of how many homeworks we have left? Uh, just homework four and then the final project. How many people in a team? I said two. And then if anyone else is left out, I will just assign it to one of the other teams. So two and, and I tell you why, because it's always the case that basically somebody works harder than others in the project. When there are basically three people, now even if one person works harder, uh, the other two people can gang on the third person. They have, it's a democracy. So we'll just give more tasks to that uh, person instead of actually uh, contributing to the project. Two, I think, I find that it's an ideal case that uh, it's equal, basically, uh, opportunity to work on the project. So they will help and push each other to work on the project. So start with a team of two. And if you have additional, if I have additional students unpaired, I will just assign them to a team with the permission of that team. Okay, so there was a question. Can you ask me the question about cardinality constraints? Um, so uh, for cardinality, I, I thought it referred to the, um, the amount of connections it can have. Like, the amount you, of, yes. Isn't, isn't it like if you have like one so, minimum and two maximum, you can only have a maximum of two, but it has to have a minimum of one connection? That's completely correct. Yes. Um, wait, I, I'm like... So wait a second. Let, let me let me think about this a little first. That's second. okay because this is the class. I will still stop the recording, uh, so we don't have this on the recording, and then I will respond to your additional questions. Is that okay?